One night, after a soft trickle of jazz, I heard the opening of a Beethoven symphony, and in a breathless ceremonial hearkening, I crossed the threshold of that life that lay permanently beyond the war. And so my return home transpired. But in my own life, there was as yet no space for what I had been through. I travelled out of the Polish winter into early spring at home, saw the woods and mountains that I loved and had dreamed of in the Russian plains, stood by the train window and breathed in the smell of fields, the fragrant meadows, and peace. In Frankfurt and Maine, my journey west ended. I lay in bed. On Good Friday, I wrote out the account of my first Russian adventure. But as I was looking around for an ending, I could find no other way than to have the narrator kill himself, since he had lived his life, hung on and lost, as his star had decreed. I read and re-read my passionate accusation, but every word of it struck me as wrong. In histrionics, irony, bitterness and uncertainty, the whole danger of the war once again became clear to me. But I was allowed only to curse and to hate and to preempt. I had to learn to say yes again, as I had intended in the period of heroic nihilism. It was the only way I could go on living. It had to be. The war could break a man, millions suffered and died, and no conquest or crusade was worth this criminal insanity. The war showed apocalyptic traits, and there I saw its cosmic necessity. I had experienced greatness and heroism, the death struggle of our men. But there was neither comradeship, willing sacrifice, fighting spirit, heroism, nor fulfilment of duty. No, but everyone died at the right time and had his own death. If many cried out for death in war, then war would have to be. And so I termed my homesickness for Russia the magnetic attraction of death, where the dead had their death, that last maturation of life, last fulfilment out of a split that no one saw, the last necessity, those survivors returning home, had the equally absolute imperative for change. Shaken or enraptured by war, the godless man turned to prayer. The man of faith cursed his God, the devout buried his trust, the fool bethought himself, the wise man fled into superficial enjoyment, broke inside, and collected the bricks for a new vision of the world. And some such change also happened to me, even if I didn't understand it. It had to be. I thought on. Stone, flower and animal were as much an expression, as much a manifestation of the divinity as man, and so to mankind a world war was the same as an earthquake to the mountain range, a hail shower to the seed, a blight to the beast, an event outside our power, a catastrophe, a cosmic occurrence. Equilibrium would be restored in whatever time came after this war. Even if all words and pictures failed, what had happened in me, this invisible and yet traumatically evident change, had to mean something. Otherwise, I was lost. And so I found salvation in the crazy notion of cosmic and human necessity, pushed into the twilight of the soul. But on Easter morning, a sad soldier with my wrecked life, I wandered among the crocuses, columbines, rain smell and thrush song of the park. Later I gave myself up to my memories. Scenes of youth, friendship, love and wanderings by the sea slipped by me, a beautiful and painful film on the canvas of the soul. I embarked on long, vinous conversations. I wrote a lot, read, and yet was unable to find any way into myself. When I got home, the sense of an intermission between wanderings wouldn't let go of me. Happily and blithely as I lived, and grateful as I was to my destiny for this reprieve, my mysterious homesickness for Russia only grew. And so I went out with new readiness as soon as my new posting came through. I was a soldier, and until all the resources and gifts of peace and freedom became available to me again, it was only as a soldier that I could withstand the challenges of life. Carried and propped everywhere, I didn't need to be me home. Russian voyage. Eastward, ho. With cheerful intuitions, I set off on my journey east and saw it as an adventure in which I was playing a tragicomic role. 
neither the war nor Russia frightened or overwhelmed me any more. Whatever I was unable to change couldn't oppress me, and so I awaited whatever the mighty and the powers had in mind for me. We crossed the Russian border into the Ukraine, a green, flowering, fertile landscape, as I never would have guessed it after that first bleak white winter. The villages nestled against the hills in picturesque idyls. On the meadows the first crop of hay was drying, but the harvest was still a long way off, and the cherries were small and green. We were headed into a gypsy life. The trains stopped everywhere. Goods trains, tracks and stations made up our world. We rode in passenger carriages, slept soundly on benches and floors, and felt at home. Our conversations were about music and poetry, philosophy of life and freedom of will, and we had little parties with our wine. Then we looked out over hills and endless fields again, rarely any wooded country. Prisoners worked on the tracks, and the often beautiful women, breaking stones and laying sleepers, reminded us painfully of our youth. Before long we saw our voyage as an excursion with plenty of picnics, and were astonished at the beauty of the world that we were passing through, rocked like babies in our swaying carriages. Tarnopol. I sat by the window and wrote. The others slept. Alone as only a solitary waking man among sleepers can be, I listened to their groans and snorts. Outside, the rain was trickling down, women wandered over a bridge, an old man begged for bread. Life went on in the gloaming, and I felt oddly disconnected from it. The plains grew mightier, as if the hills had chosen to withdraw from the east, so that man could be alone on the wide surface, under the wide heavens, alone with God and himself, nowhere hemmed in and incredibly small in his mortality. The landscape enjoined pensiveness without making one sad. Because it was summer, the earth was green, the sky was lofty and cloudy, and poppy, rape and bindweed flowered everywhere. I watched the country and made architectural and cultural notes. But what fascinated me, more than any of the structures and plans of the new order, was the Russian soil. It was like a vision to me. Weeds flourished, and crops flourished with them. Thousands of years passed over the unaltered drip-drip of Russia. Unremarked, the hourglass dribbled its sand. The earth bowed to the law of seasons, blossomed and grew mightily in the summer, burned into fall and passed into the drabness of the rainy season. Winter wrapped it in deep snow, and the frost hardened and melted seven times with the moon. But never did plains, hills and woods change their aspect. Man here was a stranger and a guest. He might plough and till the black earth, hack at the trees, sow and harvest for hundreds of years. But that didn't make him the master of this monstrous country and its spirits. He was not at home in the richness and beauty of the villages of the Ukraine, not in the clean places and woodlands of Ruthenia, not in the barrenness and poverty of the southern steppes, the northerly swamps and forests, or the giant cities he had planted as refugees for himself. He continued to dwell on the bridge between heaven and hell, as a nomad and a visitor. His fleeting time on earth disappeared among endurance, yearning and readiness, and the generations came and went, with nothing to tell them apart, one from another. The Golden Horde, Napoleon's march into uncertainty, the burning of Moscow and the flight of the Corsican, the wars with Turkey and the war with Japan had barely brushed the surface of the plain and had failed to give this land any history. The earth drank sweat, drank blood, swallowed up corpses, fields and forests thrived on the carcasses, and the burned villages returned. Timber was speedily felled and assembled with axe and hammer, and the houses were back in the landscape, hunched and cowed-looking, whitewashed, as though to hide from greatness and God. Only the churches with their onion domes, messengers from Greece and Byzantium, imprinted the landscapes, often with ugly cupolas. Christianity had affected the vision and the soul of the people, but shamans and demons, earth spirits and fairies lived on. The eagle of the Tsars had not formed the country. The Soviet star had merely wrecked the churches and converted the ribbons of fields into one endless prairie. 
the earth remained greater and mightier than the man, who, while he might have an abode here, couldn't be said to live here. The farmer hid himself in his house, filled his lamp with oil, he had bread and toil, and he sluggishly entrusted himself to the blessing of the soil. The muzhik remained the dominant type. The land had no history. The court of the Tsars played political theatre, landowners and nobles diverted themselves with culture, and the machines of the new era drove the unemployed into the cities, fugitives from the tractors, but it was all superficial. The age of the proletariat began. Everyone occupied his own space and his own wants, but never his life. And in his soul, man remained a wanderer. Though the proud women and upright men of the Ukraine loved the earth, and the Don Cossacks, like the Kalmuks and the Tatars, felt at home in the steppe that bore and nourished them, while the deracinated people might belong to their cities, in the division of their souls and under the spirits of the landscape they found no rest. Slaves and tyrants, murderers and saints, fools and prophets, they never became as one in their souls, and the masses lived as in a never-ending sleep. The anarchist with his pathos, the nihilist with his sarcasm, hate and bile, remained cheek by jowl with the sleepy peasant and the stooped worker. The brother of the humble worshipper became a fanatical destroyer of churches, and the primitive fatalist had the irredentist critic for a neighbour. Divided like the climate, an alternation between lurid oppositions, such were the people too. And so I experienced the gigantic land of Russia on this voyage, often more through dreams and fleeting sights than from a predominantly literary understanding of it. We Westerners could not understand these people or their country. Centuries sundered us from their daily reality, their spirit and their will, and the only fruits the traveller took home with him were those that he brought out with him, already ripening. It was the boundless, the ungraspable, the overwhelming quality of this soil, this twilit land that pushed us back within our own borders and that we eyed doubtfully and were afraid of and could not bear, as if the demon and the spirit of Russia preserved the land from such unsolicited, unqualified visitors. We took only riddles, clues and doubts back home with us, and our conclusions contained neither truth nor meaning. A thousand words and pronouncements provided no valid form, and only what we experienced in war and the suffering we saw was true. Perhaps those people were right who referred to the Russians as a coming people and thought that visitors there were witnesses to some inner maturation, to be starting over, to stand under the red dawn of a new age and grow into the future, fed at once by the millennia and by youth. We too became aware of this great preparation, introspection and openness to destiny. But when we experienced its winter, then Russia became a via crucis to us, a Golgotha, and the Russian was man on an everlasting Good Friday. This we were taught by the war, but we knew that after the war, the black and yellow soils, clay and sand, loam and peat, would lie there as if they had never been touched, the plain unconquered, and the people there would have remained strangers to us. The soul poured itself out into this landscape, became empty and filled itself again with dire need, and by the end nothing would have happened. But perhaps the land once came to meet us in peace, when we carried our sadness and our melancholy through the gloomy beauty of Ruthenia's forests, when we were lonely under the grey skies, sniffing the heart-sickness of the foggy hills and thin grasses in the autumn wind, and went missing in their majesty. When we experienced the Ukrainian summer as on our so friendly visit, loving the villages under fruit trees and the tall poplars lending their shade to the white thatched cottages, hung with golden ears of maize, when we brushed through the fertile, flowering, ripening prodigality of the fields, when we drank in the red evenings to the singing of women and saw wild dances at their celebrations, and when we stood in the plain, merely human, naked and offered to God, who was everywhere near, threatening and vindictive, demanding and summoning, so that the persecuted man felt like fleeing into any valley and hiding in any available hollow from the ineluctable. When the grass danced before God, when the ignorant beast pastured in divine peace and the farmer did his daily work, 
and when the stranger succumbed to his demons or was torn to shreds by an attack from God. This I had learned from Rilke and from the poets of Russia. We had to see the writer's models in the big cities, the song and dance of the boyars in the opera, the celebrations of Cossacks and maids in bars, to take part in the feasts of the rich and to beg and suffer with the poor, work and live there. Maybe then we might overcome this landscape. But perhaps all we experienced then were memories of the war, drawing erroneous comparisons, and everything remained elusive and impalpable as ever for the visitor from the West. Meanwhile, the Russian soil indifferently swallowed quantities of blood and bones. The decomposing corpse nourished the insouciant tree and the corn on barren and rich soil, and the grass straightened itself again where the soldier's boot had once tramped it down. Thousands of years passed, and the Russian had only one aspect, and the only victor remained the earth. So I dreamed the live-long summer day, and still didn't believe in my pictures and the shapes they made in me. I thought on and looked for the forces that were ruling in Russia today, trying to work for change. Once I hadn't known much about Russia. I had thought only of an endlessly large, unknown, unpopulated and poverty-stricken country, with summers that burned like straw fires, endless winters in icy rigour and snow, hunting stories from the forests of Siberia, mines in the Urals, gold diggers and adventurers, steppes and droughts and mythical cities. But beyond a few details, nothing corresponded to the actuality. The fantastic inventions of Gogol, Dostoevsky's psychology, and the names of Tolstoy, Pushkin, Chekhov, Korolenko, Andreev, Gorky, Turgenev, Prishvin, Leskov only talked about themselves. The history books had nothing to say about the essential things. The music of Mussorgsky, Rimsky-Korsakov, Glazunov, Borodin, Rachmaninov, Stravinsky and Tchaikovsky gave us only a dreamland and magic world, no true form. They were the lost traces of a dead time. From the living, we learned nothing. The borders were down, and we believed as little of the newspapers as we did the banned books we sometimes got a hold of. And the same with my pondering about things I had seen myself, whose sources, a planetary display, were as dreamy and insubstantial as our knowledge of them. A vast, unimaginable effort had taken place. A century had been pressed into twenty years, plan after plan drawn up and fanatically pursued and put into effect with colossal expenditure of energy and material. It demanded huge sacrifices in terms of shortages, difficulties, material, labour and spirit. Many things remained attempt, bold experiment. Facades were built, fragments, but sometimes it felt like nothing more than the play of a gigantic baby. But in these generations of Russians were stored energies and substances that promised completion. The hurried and botched were subjected to a process of labour that gulped them down whole. People formed themselves in accordance with the will of the time, became technicians, engineers, workers, organisers, and finally elements of the Red Army, which stood there like a mechanical colossus, a sort of robot, a titanic sum of spirit, weaponry, men, faith and power. Total mobilisation had taken place in Russia as much as at home. I was frightened. I no longer thought in my own language. I had learned that from Ernst Junger. What he had seen in his figure of the worker had become fact. Relieved to be rid of my pointless thinking and desire to understand, I started to reread his work. Kharkov. War revealed what had taken place and what had become of Russia. We saw gigantic buildings, palaces of administration and tenements side by side with tiny huts that cowered in their shade. Stations and buildings had been destroyed. We noticed nothing of the life within them. We saw figures that might have emerged from the pages of Russian authors, yet we were unable to see into their souls. We smoked makorka and drank lemonade, but even that didn't tell us anything about the way people lived and ate and drank. We saw only the uniforms of the soldiers in battle, not the human beings, only the masses in the streets, not their purpose and life. We encountered ruins and half suspected they might be unfinished new buildings. 
War multiplied our estrangement, inferno. We turned back into ourselves and our destinies. We travelled to Kursk, to our adventure. Hospital trains full of wounded from the summer offensive passed us. We were headed for war, for the proximity of death, and in our exaltation we thought of ourselves as doomed. We took on the attitude as if it were a mask. In long conversations we thought about the meaning and value of our destiny. Pain and seriousness appeared on our countenances and yielded silently to the law. We were moved by dreams of crusades, and we decorated ourselves with roses for battle and dying. The roses withered. In the end, there was only death. The yearnings of youth pulled us toward the distance. We tasted the lees of our days, and still each of us hoped to be the envoy who one day would take home news of the catastrophe. We desired completion, and still hoped to give destiny the slip. Kursk. We got out and lay down in the wilderness of a garden. Plaster figures of Russian boys and girls stood by the paths. The opera was in ruins. The church was a ravaged museum of godlessness. A smaller church we found with new icons and altar. The dwellings, poor and colourless, resembled the landscape. We went to the soldier's home and read, played chess and played on the pedalless piano. Later we bought red roses from an old woman and stuck them in our buttonholes. We saw only laughing faces, heard the astonished shouts of children and women, and some girls shot us fiery glances. We dubbed ourselves the Rosencavaliers. From a terrace we gazed out into the dying evening and talked of death, the coming battles and the remote prospect of returning home. We rode on a goods train as far as Okochevka. There we put up tents. At night, wind and rain drummed against the canvas and shook the guy ropes. We felt protected and told ghost stories. Under grey morning skies, we awaited orders. We marched. Rain alternated with broiling sun. Before long, we felt the burden of the march. We were carrying full packs, our rifles pressed against our shoulders. Our blood grew sluggish. We were reeling and dizzy. Thirst tormented us. We found nothing to drink. We were on the road past nightfall, and then we were permitted to put up our tents in the rain and sleep. Russian planes circled overhead. German fighters and bombers buzzed past us on their way to the battle at Voronezh. More marching. The road vanished by our efforts, and our thirst became unendurable. A well. Brief rest. We lowered our buckets. Winching them up seemed to take forever. Then we drank, repeatedly, icy, revivifying water, washed the salt sweat off our faces, cooled our pulse points, and slumped back in the shade. We bandaged up our inflamed, sore, blistered feet. Off again. I couldn't keep going for much longer. The quantities of water I had drunk made me shake. I felt sick. Several men collapsed. Rest. I too stayed behind. Then we travelled on a truck after the marching column and stopped in Kolbenar. There I lay in the gutter, unable to walk, enfeebled by wild heart palpitations. My comrades carried me into a tent. The following morning I went to the doctor and was put on the sick list. I was told to go back to Kursk for observation. And so I took my leave of my comrades, the Rosen Cavaliers, and became the envoy who brought the news of their dying and their readiness to die. Away in the distance the others were marching toward the enemy, a long, tired line of them, widely spaced in the endlessness of Russia. A little dust enwrapped them, and the road faded into the distance. I watched them go. A goods train came to pick up the wounded. There was barely any room for the sick, but with my new companions I clambered up onto the roof of the first wagon. The locomotive started to pull. My journey west began. Slowly we travelled into the evening. Dense smoke swathed us. Like coal miners with crusted black faces, we laughed at one another. Going home. I went very quiet. I saw the track where we had marched the day before, miserable and drained, one of the numberless roads where we had marched, whose dust still clung to our boots. Meadow scent and hay smell mixed with coal smoke. The wind cut at my face. I was transported into a limitless serenity. 
We spent the night in Okochevka. Noon the next day we were back in Kursk. Trucks carried us to chaotic scenes at the hospital. A red multi-storey building took us in, a warren of untended soldiers, wounded men in old bandages, men groaning, delirious and sapped. One of the doctors had suffered a nervous collapse, the other examined only when wholly drunk, his bottle of schnapps in among instruments and bandages, and he sent every wounded man home. To me too he gave a pass back to Warsaw. That night the war was raging over Kursk. Russian planes bombed the city. A munitions train went up in an astonishing fireworks. Searchlights drilled into the darkness, ak-ak batteries fired and bombs whooshed down into the night. Goods trains shipped us to Warsaw. On the way we bought strawberries from Russian women and sat in the doorways, sleeping on benches or on fouled straw. We didn't ask. We were long since used to it all. Day and night the train rumbled on. Everything was adventure, nothing was danger any more. Those condemned to die experienced mercy. In the evenings the forests stood there in infinite silence while heaven shook out its stars. Going home, Warsaw. I soon felt better. I played music with a singer and a cellist and kidded around with the nurses. Only the nights were hard. I couldn't sleep for nerves, and the excitements of the trip, the doubts and hopes of the man going home, still took effect on me. Soon I wasn't supplied with morphine any more. So I got up again, dressed in the dark, and wandered around the quiet corridors. I ran into the night nurse, who took me back to her room. Every so often she would tour the wards, listen to the soldiers at rest, bring them medicines, and come back to me. We talked all night. I didn't tell her much. From her, though, I heard the tragedy of a woman, a nurse in wartime. No woman, not even a whore, could have experienced men as naked and shameless as she did. Not only the helpless, bleeding, purulent body which she tended lay naked before her. The soul didn't hide itself either. She lived a life among wounds, pus, mutilations, pain and excrements. The soldiers came to her, just torn away from the front, from an unwilling continence. The nurse was the first woman they had seen, often enough the only one. Another being in uniform, another form without a face, and therefore nothing but sex in disguise. The nurse saw only animals, only uniforms, with a quivering piece of meat in them that just lately had been suffering, and the moment it started to feel better was desirous. She saw the eyes of the soldiers. They followed her, watched her walk, groped under her dress. One disappointment followed another. Like children, the soldiers first put themselves in the care of her hands, and their eyes implored her for a kindly word. The nurse trusted them, laughed with them, and the patient got better. His condition improved. He wasn't capable of gratitude. The nurse didn't demand it either. But now began the double entendre, the suggestions, jokes, cracks. The nurse was still able to laugh with them, to understand the crude manners, and let the human being, the soldier, behave as he felt he had to. But the soldiers didn't recognise the limits. The animal in them grew stronger. They desired any woman, and there was only the nurse. Now her comradeship was misused. She couldn't establish any respect. Her humour and kind-heartedness failed. Squalor had the upper hand, and the hatred at not obtaining the booty expressed itself in foul tirades. I had seen it all for myself. But the nurse had more to say. There were some who adapted to the men. They became whores. They didn't love them. But they helped themselves to a male from out of the uniformed mass. It was one beast among so many. The next day they chose a different one. These unknowing whores had an easy time of it. Others treated the soldiers as naughty children, with the scepticism of mothers who are apt to resign, or nuns who do their work out of compassion and for love of Christ, don't ask for the world or any reward, who long ago renounced and didn't have any fear of the soldiers either. Most of the nurses, though, were young. She stroked her hair. I didn't look at her. She spoke on, softly. It was hardest for the women. They felt like women, they wanted to remain women, 
They did their work in the war, and they did it willingly. But one day they wanted to love and marry and have children with just one of these men, and now there were a thousand soldiers talking to them about love, till they stopped believing in it. In the mass, the individual lost his value and identity. The nurse came to the conclusion that all men must be the same. No exception. No serious-faced patient was able to persuade her otherwise. Patients, too, they had only sex in mind. The nurses no longer believed in being and in heart. If they once felt tenderness and gave themselves, then the naked animal, the soldier, would reappear, and they would hear in every word of love nothing but hidden lust, from every sigh just a harsh groan. And so they became critical and suspicious, made comparisons, and still couldn't find any safe refuge. In the end, they found their own virginity ridiculous in such a world. Maybe they clung to the more impressive mask of a doctor. But when they thought of an hour of love with him, they would feel alarmed. The mask would drop, disappointment would return, still more bitter, never to be expunged. I didn't reply to her. My soft affection for the night nurse broke as I listened to her. I didn't know if I would prove any sort of exception. In this way, whatever was dear and precious to women withered in them. Their lives lost their meaning, their loving became a swindle, or it shriveled in their fear of sex. No one, no one was spared by this war. I travelled on to Neubrandenburg. That was my return home. I enjoyed the summer there, writing and reading. After my release I was given a period of leave. I spent it at home. I thought of my imminent departure, a third tour in the east. As long as the war went on, so long the uncertainty remained in the proximity of death. Nothing could be finished or achieved, everything remained fragmentary, and the interval made the time ahead still heavier. All roads led into blackness. The war continued and there was no end to the pilgrimage. I wandered back into my Russian adventure, still wearing the mask of a soldier. Every return home was a present from fate before the great danger. My abiding was only a period of grace, and the happiness and benediction of home were something like a last meal before execution. Russia would not let go of me. I travelled toward the winter once more and to one of the focuses of the war, Rushev. I went through change after change, till I became the being that the stars wanted. Thus I experienced the hell of winter war on my contemplative journey, still playing my old masked game. I was still living more in seeming than in being. I was playing with words and roles and never became a wise man and never a monk. God remained a stranger to me. Only in the direst emergency did I seek him out, drifting through misanthropy and contempt and failing to learn love. Destiny once more had to conduct me to that edge, where danger, death and pain renewed spirit, soul and values. The beginning and ending of my pilgrimage kept returning, and when the path ended, so would my life. Warsaw We waited for orders to move up to the front. The days passed in idleness, and the nights belonged to our adventures among strangers in a strange land. We strolled through the streets, Parks and mansions stood by winding lanes, tenement houses and ruins. Department stores and plain and gold gaudy churches were adjacent to ordinary shops, tiny bars, pubs, cafes and junk shops. Valuable gems lay among costume jewellery and glitter. Beggars, shoeblacks and soldiers pushed their way through the dense crowd. We passed slender, supple women with beautiful features under their makeup and abandoned girls. In the evenings we went to bars or nightclubs. There we experienced the excitement, the atmosphere, the charm of a metropolis. Passionate dancers stripped on stage and in sheer veils sat down among us. We drank sweet wines, listened to exciting music, saw the wealth, elegance and peace of the clients, and found the soul of the people more easily in the eerie decadence, in play and show, under the glittery heavens of the cabaret, than in their day-to-day -day reality, much less their serious art. We didn't understand the songs and parodies. We felt we were homeless, deracinated wanderers living for the moment. When we returned, girls and women offered themselves to us for a piece of bread, 
and our amorous adventures gave meaning to this pause before the fighting. Lithuania We drove through a hilly autumnal landscape in October light. Serious and in pensive colours, the fields lay there, pale green and brown in muted tones. Broad-leafed woods died in orgies of red and gold, and gloomy pines slowly grew into the gloomy skies. Melancholy and sorrow blew in our faces. We, though, loved the quiet beauty of this world. Life drifted simply by. Tidy villages leaned against hills, wooden houses in plain gardens. A yellow river flowed amid gleaming streets, graveyards and ruins, copses and distant birches. The journey delighted us. Meadows and pastures surrounded Dunaberg in the evening light. Everything drifted past us, letting itself be seen, but not touched or held. We knew this world, yet we remained guests in it. We took no part in the destinies of its people, in the breath of the earth, in the growing and withering all around us. Vitebsk, Smolensk, Vyazma, and a thousand other villages and hamlets remained cameos in the endless journey. Only the spirits of war gained in influence. Destruction and emptiness, solitude, nearness of fate, and readiness to die took us in. We no longer dreamed of necessity and barely sensed the adventure of our journey. We thought only of the madness of war, the crime of the age, and no longer shuffled the stars for our personal destinies. We lived our lives surrounded by death. No more than that. And so we came twenty-seven to the front at Arashev. Cool, showery days blew by with the autumn. Puddles filled with ochre-coloured water and became swamps, the bottomless mire around Rashev. Leafless alders stood in the swamps, pines and birches dripped with moisture. Soiled and mashed, the steppe grass lay on the ground. Murky streams flowed down soft roads. The earth was sodden. With every step our boots sank. A shower anointed us each time we pushed aside some fir twigs. We left our tents and set off to the trenches at Tabakovo and the fairy tale forests. Covered with mud, coated with crusts of dirt, in sodden boots and coats, we stamped through the mire. Everything was damp and foul, the bread as much as our clothing. Rust coated our rifles. The sun alternated with night frost and snow. There was no refuge from the rainy season. We found the trenches soft and often flooded. Water dripped into the primitive bunkers and the crude sentry holes, and the horses collapsed on the roads. A horse was more precious than a man, but we took our fate as it came, lived in our memories, and dreamed of a safe return home. Soon we became habituated to it, as though nothing had changed since the muddy season of the previous year. Only the landscape touched us more nearly. Alder scrub, swampy hollows and hills with vestiges of woods manifested a melancholy beauty, shifting between idyllic wasteland and frightening barrenness. We re-immersed ourselves in the mysteries of the Russian soil. We no longer marched, no longer overnighted in villages and barns. For a long way behind the trenches, there was no house or barn intact. All that remained of Tabakovo were charred beams bricks, gardens full of frost, spoiled vegetables, alders and streets. Beams and boards had been stripped and used in the construction of our dugouts. We lived in a kind of glorified rifle pit. A planked ceiling protected us against light mortar shells. A box stove afforded some warmth. We picked up firewood wherever we could. We were unable to wash, and the field kitchens in a remote ravine didn't serve us before dusk but our serenity and calm stood us in good stead. Danger was normal, and what had once petrified us as we first set out now barely touched us. Mind and spirit accommodated the requirements of destiny. Three hundred yards in front of us were the Russian trenches, a dip in the middle and some wire entanglements. Rifle grenades flew across without interruption, whistling and warbling over our heads or exploding on the ramparts. From time to time a light mortar would sprinkle our trench and the abutting area. Snipers made every step out of the trench a race against death. 
we became indifferent and didn't know whether it was resignation or trust in God. We moved between the clay walls like funambulists, walking on duckboards and narrow metal grids over the mud. Many of us became ill through the cold and wet. The damp clay encrusted coats and blankets, the walkways sank in the water. We were unable to change our shoes or socks. We couldn't make a fire in the daytime because the Russians would use the smoke from the wet wood to aim at. Most of the rifle pits you could get into only on your hands and knees. A tarpaulin hung in place of a door. Days were an alternation of weapons cleaning and trench work, and at night we went out on sentry duty every two or three hours to stare into no man's land in case an enemy patrol appeared, and to wait whether a bullet hit us or a direct hit from a mortar spattered our blood and brains against the trench walls. Then the guts would freeze to the clay, scraps of cloth and flesh would lie around, and someone would come across vestiges of a comrade many days later and not recognise them. The nights brought only brief snatches of sleep. Sentry duty alternated with periods of readiness, and at dawn the risk of an attack grew. So we stood and watched in ones and twos. Ghosts, shadows, we could hardly take in the other's face. The flares plucked us out of the darkness, dipped us into their Bengal lights for seconds at a time, suspending their harsh white golden yellow pale green or blood-red fires over the motionless scene of forest edge and trench, and as they went out they plunged us back into primal night. Fogs lolled over the tawny yellow grass. Every shrub turned into a menacing phantom. The stalks loomed gigantically and became approaching enemies in the wind. After midnight the waning moon climbed over the horizon, red and around over the floor of fog, as if blood were being squeezed from the hills. Gradually it swelled up like a pumpkin mask, while the night turned into a magic stage for the quiet gathering and dispersing of the silvery clouds. Other nights shone with breadth and starry clarity. Orion and Vega, the Wayne, Pisces and Gemini, and the shimmering ribbon of the Milky Way revolved calmly and endlessly around the Pole Star indifferent to war and peace on this planet. Below them, luminous bursts of tracer streaked hither and thither. The beauty and lostness of the firmament were of no concern to us. Dead tired, freezing, yearning, powerless soldiers on sentry duty, we were here to kill. Machine guns hammered briefly and thinly, a shell struck. That was all that mattered in our world. Full moon, the bright nights of the Russian north, the no-man's land lay charmed in the white glare and sheen, and the night became a magical day. We could see across almost as far as the Russian lines. Mist rose, the cold sniffed us out, and the dream god carried us all home. Dawn brought a sacred lull. Daybreak occurred like a relieving dream. The beauty of those hours was worth nights of fear and travail. Some of those dangers and difficulties shook and confused us. The feeling of existence strengthened through time and suffering, and an orbic enthusiasm carried us through deadly hours. In the midst of death we knew. We are. The sun went down in apocalyptic colours. Every scene became precious because it was between goodbye and return home. Night passed, and like a dawn, a new, ever more miraculous return lay behind all our adventurous wanderings. One night, going back to the dugout with food, we lost our way. We leapt over a collapsed trench into no man's land and ran on as far as the Russian wires. But then we found our way unmolested and looked back on our reckless undertaking as on a kind of comedy. The night frosts grew colder, the earth froze, and sometimes we caught the scent of rime and snow in the air. Autumn was coming to an end. The second winter campaign in Russia was beginning. We withdrew our anti-tank gun from the trench. We lugged it back across trenches and no man's land. One man was wounded. A horse died the next day. Another position, less exposed, farther away from the enemy, took us in. Life went on, but death remained our daily bread. Not far from the fairy tale wood, our bunker lay in a bomb crater. Low vegetation poked bare stalks across the saps, 
and all around the bleak steppe spread its expanse. We watched through the nights, digging under a sickle moon. The fireworks of flares played away in the distance, and we were glad to be dwelling in greater security. Our combativeness had long since been transmuted into a meek endurance. We made ourselves as comfortable as we could in the limited space. The bunker was warm and offered a bench and a table and enough room to sleep. We didn't need more than that. With brandy, hot lemonade and toast, we had ourselves the small joys of life. The front became restless. At night there was a crashing and rattling in the trenches, there were flashes everywhere, and we grew anxious. But before long, calm returned. Days of bright sunshine followed, of an unbelievable luminosity that only the Russian winter could produce over the frozen landscape. We found frozen daisies, tiny blue stars of blossom and withered leaves. Frost breathed over the land, and we sat by the stove. The wood crackled, the flames danced, the wind sang in the stovepipe, and outside the stars wheeled by. After midnight there was profound darkness. The skies were occluded by thick clouds, a strong breeze got up, and then the snow whirled over the plain, the yellow grasses and woods lay there in white flecks and streaks, filled up the hollows and gradually converted the land. A yellow-grey sky gaped down. With staring eyes we looked about us. As long as we stayed awake, our souls could not die. The winter remained mild for a long time. We were kitted out with woollens and padded suits against snow and cold. Felt boots arrived, and the soldier's life was easier to bear. Pale sky, details of snow work on branches and grass, glittering hoarfrost in the morning light and quiet on the front. We loved the world when it was like that. My comrades were dispatched to Olinin, where the Russians were trying hard to make a breakthrough. They froze, were wounded, but had to hold out. They suffered from frostbite, lived in dugouts in the snow, without any stoves, and returned weeks later half-starved, sick and ghostly, a clutch of survivors from dire necessity. I stayed behind on my own, armed only with a pistol, to guard the bunker and keep order. So, in the middle of my second winter campaign, I was living a kind of hermit's life. I chopped wood and burned it, brewed myself coffee, wrote and sang to myself. The only time I ever saw a fellow human being was when I was getting food. By the light of a candle or oil lamp, I sat at the table, listened to the humming and crackling of the little stove, stared into the dying embers or the flickering dance of flames, dreamed and killed time. From time to time, I received visits from some other solitary, and we told each other about our lives in peacetime, our war postings and our hopes. We stared out into the driving snow, and on quiet days walked beside the trenches, as though through a miniature glacier world. Everything that had appeared so important outside sank in my inner peace. It was only in my heart that the fullness of pictures and dreams lived on. I was living from stocks laid down in the distant past. There were no revelations, but light and falling snow. Flickering of fire and moonlight became events to me. I lived like a hermit all alone in space, far from the war and the noisy bustle of the world. Dusk. I pulled on my camouflage suit, picked up my mess tin and field bottle, raised the sheet away from the entrance and stepped outside. A blizzard was racing over the plain. It almost took the breath away from my mouth. A dense veil of dancing, whirling, tumbling flakes enwrapped me, and the sharp wind cut into my face like a razor. Through the grey-white whirling and seething, I couldn't see the sky, and the blanket of snow deepened incessantly. Only for a few steps could I make out the ground underfoot, a tree, a shrub. I struck out in the approximate direction of the church and leaned into the howling storm. It blew over the land with the hooting and whining of a foghorn. I had been walking for a long time, struggling on, bathed in sweat, and still hadn't reached the path to the church defile. At last I did encounter a track, but it wasn't one I knew. I had never been here before. 
I crossed it, and the dusk tipped blue and murky grey inks into the chasing white. I hurried so as not to be late, and suddenly saw a wood by my side, a low stand of trees, not a forest, not the familiar fairy tale wood. I must have slipped through a space between the trenches into no man's land. I felt uncertain and turned back. The snow had wiped out my footprints, and space seemed to blur in the half-light. I no longer knew which way to turn. The foghorn boomed in my ear incessantly. I hit the road again, and this time followed it. No traces of truck or sleigh traffic marked it. I reached another piece of wood and heard the slow ticking of Russian machine guns. Then a hail of bullets clattered past me. I dropped to the ground, took the safety off my pistol. I crept back, went down the road the other way, and encountered a shot-up armoured car. But there were many like that. Nearby I saw the ruins of a village, not Tabakovo, not Pondarovo. I looked in vain. I shouted into the din, ran in circles, stopped, panting, stood there exhausted, helpless, full of uncertainty and fear in the night. It had gotten dark, and the snowstorm didn't let up. I gave up the pointless enterprise, crawled into the armoured car, lit a cigarette, and decided to wait for day to break or the storm to blow over. Indifferent to the danger and dog-tired, I fell asleep. Awakening after midnight, I stood trembling and reeling on the street. The blizzard had let up. I found a telephone line and followed it. It took me to the ravine, and from there I soon found my way back. I got to the bunker exhausted, lit a fire, ate a piece of old bread and lay down. But I was unable to sleep for many hours. The foghorn howled in my ears, and I was glad when the day arrived. When I awoke, I was snowed in. The early light was dimmed. A thick wall of snow had buried me. My comrades came calling and dug me out. The fairy tale forest stood there all peacefully, the hills white. White coats draped the firs, the white bunkers and trenches. There were no tracks in the virginal snow. And yet the demons of this landscape were persecuting me, filling my soul with icy silence and a fatalism that made me hold on and endure like grass and tree. But perhaps they were doing their bit to assimilate the inner man to his fate, to enable him to suffer the inhuman. My contemplative hermit life continued. One night the snow creaked from cautious footsteps. I heard Russian spoken and I clutched my pistol at the ready. But the patrol failed to spot the snowed-in entrance and went on its way. And then I left the snowy wastes. In the fairy tale forest, a subterranean city was coming into being. Bunker lined up by the side of Bunker, all down the road. Just as into the last house on the edge of the world, I moved in with a mortar unit facing the enemy, to serve as a machine gunner against shock troops and scouts. We lived in plenty of space and warmth, were given plenty of food, put out few sentries, and were allowed enough sleep. This was where I celebrated Advent Sunday, the time of preparation. Usually on the qui vive, I now settled in to wait for the promise to be redeemed. A presentiment of terrible events alternated with high spirits and moodiness. I acquired more confidence and calmly remembered the previous year's advent. The Russians assembled reinforcements opposite us. An increased stage of alert was ordered. It began to thaw. The snow melted and dribbled down the walls of the trenches. The earth softened and meltwater soaked our boots and made the felt heavy and cold. The bare trees stared into chill grey days and the ice cracked in the fishing pond. Russian deserters brought news of a planned attack and we were on the alert. For four days and three nights we had no sleep, always in our heavy winter tunics. The stove remained lit, sweat ran down our foreheads and in the icy draught our feet froze. The cold applied its wolf's teeth again, but the drips continued to fall from the ceiling of the bunker. Vainly we put out tarpaulins. Whatever we touched was damp and mired. Our trousers and coats were clammy. Our pallets were covered with clumps of mud. We waited, choked down our mouldy bread, and nothing happened. Alert. Our weapons froze. The shoes sat on our feet like a layer of ice. Alert. 
equally prepared to die or flee. It mattered little whether it was a Russian bullet that brought us down or our own barrage, which would probably be levelled at our positions, whether we broke down on the road and died of exhaustion or froze to death on sentry duty in the endless nights. One hour, and we lost all sensation in our hands and feet, a second, and the body shook as in fever, trembled, shook, deadened. Three hours, and the blood slowed, dreams came, and suddenly the relief brought the half-demented sentry back to ghastly life. We thawed out, stared at one another, a ghostly ring of seven deathly pale soldiers, discoloured by bunker fug, smoke and soot, with wild hair and desperate eyes, tormented by lice. In our mess tins, remnants of food decomposed. We hid all clocks. Time didn't move. Waiting became a torment. It wore us out. Everything lost meaning and purpose, and we longed for the relief of conflict. A wounded man was sent back bandaged up with paper. Men went missing. We had to hold out. We were soldiers and the pioneers of a great new age that we didn't believe in. Everything passed. Before long, night darkened over the battlefield, and the tracks of wolves multiplied in the snow. Decomposition took us in its loving caress. We dreamed of youth before the war stole it from us, pictured our unlived lives yearningly to ourselves. There was a night that was full of drinking, singing, dancing, kissing, and there were a thousand others full of music, magic, ecstasy, laughter, dreaming, walking and blissful sadness. But they were never ours. We saw the snow. God had made it, as he had made us. We thought of home, the books we had to burn along with their lies. We had to go home, bolt the doors, view as from a distance the decline of the West, and strangle our sons the instant their mothers had given birth to them, so that there would be no more war in this world. Life was great, Advent, and the saviour at hand. Already the Russian munitions factories were filling shells with our names on them. We added to the number of birch crosses with steel helmets dangling on them where men who had been turned into beasts rotted away. That was the accomplishment of this war, and so we plunged into despair. Gallo's humour failed us. This suffering was proof against irony, and we merely laughed in the grinning face of our misery. Fiendish grimaces flowered on the dungy bed of our advent. We could stand to wait in our bunker no longer. As soon as day broke, we hurried out to the edge of the fairy tale forest. Fresh snow had fallen, and we could see down the long slope to the fishing pond. In front of us stretched the demonic landscape of war. Fog in dense swathes lifted out of the gully and masked the coniferous heights opposite with dim haze. The plain faded away into the distance with the grey, pale, reddish evening sky. Blue-white shadows and yellow lights played over the snow. There was no one in sight, no animal, no word, no bird call. Only the bunkers, slowly emitting white smoke from their wet wood fires, which mounted in frozen strips over the valley, as though ghostly blacksmiths were pouring the bullets for the coming battle. Slowly we headed back into the fairy tale forest. Snow had fallen overnight, lay thick and soft on the ground, and the branches bore its mild weight. Beautiful and silent, the wood contrasted with the foggy ground in the early light. Abruptly, the great symphony of war struck up and surged over it. We heard the detonations of the Russian artillery bounced forward from the hills behind their lines. The shells exploded way back in our hinterland. The echo thundered, compounded itself into an elemental roar, and went on resounding like a choir of ghosts. Then the first impacts were heard in the little wood. Artillery shells burst with dull thumps. Tank rounds and anti-tank munitions came whistling and howling and blew up with shrill crashes. Mortar shells plummeted down without notice. In between, machine guns were threading their deadly nets. The salvos of Russian smoke projectors came drumming toward us. There was an incessant shrieking, rumbling, whistling, howling and droning that swelled into a storm and went under in an endless rolling thunder in which we couldn't distinguish the individual discharges and explosions. This was drumfire. 
We sat in the bunker fully dressed with our weapons at the ready. Two layers of beams and a few shovelfuls of earth were all that protected us, and still it felt like a relief from the crippling stiflement of waiting. The battle was underway, and the fighting couldn't be any worse than this overture. The bunker trembled and shook. Calmly we looked out into the fury, into fire, flying clumps of earth and smoke. Black dust fountained up vertically and came spattering down. A rain of splinters and frozen clay came down outside the door. Grey-brown, yellowish-black, and pale grey swaths of gunpowder smoke blew by. The vapour scraped our lungs and stung our eyes. As suddenly as it had begun, the raging terror ended, passing farther into our hinterland. The telephone lines were shredded, no runners dared go out, but we knew. At this very moment, the first wave of Russians would be charging against the trenches in front of us. We hurried to the mortar, rigged up the machine gun, and saw them coming, in white winter camouflage, in groups and lines. Defensive fire began. We saw them fall, falter and flee. An hour passed. The second wave also broke under our combined machine gun, infantry artillery and mortar fire. Then night started to fall. The dead lay a long way in front of us. The wounded crawled back. Our wounded were carried to the doctor. It was eerily quiet, except for the occasional shot, like a delayed echo of the noise of the day. By now the fairy tale forest had undergone a transformation. The snow was no longer white, rather it was covered with a crust of powder slime, trodden underfoot, mixed with dust, shrapnel and earth, all of which meant that the once white forest floor gave off nothing more than an uncertain ghostly glimmer in the early evening. The wood itself seemed to have been partially cleared. Piles of uprooted trees lay about. Shell crater was planted by shell crater, and the shells had sheared the frozen branches off the trunks. Shredded and broken, the damaged branches stretched out, the bark lacerated by shrapnel. The firs were bare torsos, robbed of their smashed needled twigs. The beauty and life of the wood had fallen victim to the war, just like all the dead and wounded all about. We survivors, though, loved the danger, which we preferred to the murderous waiting around. In this battle of material, life proved itself to be the stronger in its orgiastic desire to be. The war conducted us into a dreamy place, and men who otherwise were perfectly peaceable characters felt a secret yearning for horrid feats of endurance and arms. The primal man awoke in us. Instinct replaced intellect and feeling, and a transcendent vitalism adopted us. But now we returned to our bunker sobered, exhausted and frozen. That night the weapons spoke once more. There was a dialogue of machine guns, bickering from trench to trench. On sentry duty we listened. Foggy, snow-bright nights with flares burning out high up in the haze, giving us mute ghosts some human traits. Here a German machine gun called out to the enemy in rapid, dry stabs of fire that we were there, waiting and alert, and then the calmer ticking of a Russian one replied after a short interval, or spoke up as our weapon fell silent. The fugal echo of the bullets was heard a while longer. This was a concert of technical orchestras, of mechanical instruments played upon by their victims. Metal ruled. Grass and trees had to suffer as much as humans. The following day heard a noisy anarchy of warring voices, pell-mell the fire of artillery, smoke projectors, tank guns and mortars. The last attacks faltered in front of our wire entanglements. By evening it was over. We counted the fallen in front of our lines and picked out our dead and wounded, named names whose bearers were no longer alive. Almost unmoved, without regret, like mere statistical data, from which we passed on to the duties of the day. One member of our platoon had received a direct hit. We picked up his limbs from the blood-crusted snow, scraped the mass of flesh and guts together, and sprinkled earth over brains and blood. What was left, almost weightless, we wrapped in canvas and buried outside Tabakovo, as if the material war had turned us into soulless machines. Many times the dead could find no rest either. 
They lay there for weeks sometimes in summer, decomposing in cornfields while the blowflies grubbed around in their eyes, till someone found them, and a burial commando sheeted them, loaded up the slimy mass, and buried it in a war cemetery for fallen heroes. In this way, even the graves outside Tabakovo were dug up, and the remains buried elsewhere. There they rested in peace, and their deeds in everlasting renown. Afterward, we were finally allowed to sleep. A few collapsed into almost unconscious exhaustion. The rest of us remained awake. Each time we nodded off, the shells whined into our consciousness and shook us awake, and in the silence outside, the roar of memory seemed to be amplified. We were still swaying along the bridge between life and death. Time and time again I relived those minutes when I lay unprotected in a crater, and the drum fire flared up around, ploughed the crater rim, and dumped snow and dirt on me till I blacked out. My comrades dug me up, carried me to a bunker, and thought I was dead. When I awoke, it was as though I had come from another world. Because we were living in close proximity to death, there was nothing difficult about dying. It was the hesitancy and ubiquitousness of death that made him so great and terrible. His favourites were not those who were long spared, but those who died swiftly. Us, though, he was transforming season by season. He conducted us through the secret chambers of the soul, awoke the angel in the good man and the spirits of Cain in the bad. He filled us and peeled us. He caused us to bear fruit, and from a drop of bitter wormwood he made a whole sea of desperation. In this way he grew over us as a victorious tree. Like a shadow, he set himself up in front of the weak, plunged him into the laughter of despair, awoke feverish lust for life and excess, quenched the last fires of renunciation and goodness, reverence and faith, ripped off his mask and let him fall like rotten carrion. Some men inclined to death like ripe fruit. The much-travelled wanderer was only too willing to drop anchor in his Hades, and the preparing for it made him happy. Death was almost like a light from within. There was no spirit world for him to wreck, and his delay crowned time. In his nearness, all values were revised. Gold was vanity, while every piece of bread became precious. Books shallowed or found deeper meaning. Love affairs found their completion or their trickling away. Only what was essential survived. In this way, death made us into new and better people. Birch crosses told the tale of that winter. Sand slowly slipped through the hourglass, and every grain rested in God's hands. We had no sense of that. We experienced the beginning of the new year still in the fairy tale forest, celebrated New Year's Eve with brandy and bold talk, and at midnight put on a fireworks display from all our weapons at once. 1943. A drunken walk followed, a sleigh ride, and we slept in late. But at the sight of the beheaded trees, the bare shrubs, that not even the hoar frost, the visible soul of delicacy, was able to touch with life. Amid all the wreckage of beauty and peace, we were regularly overcome by the feeling that all this was leading just such an unreal, spectral life as we ourselves. Then, out of nowhere, the name Ghostwood cropped up, and before long it was everywhere. We were like ghosts ourselves. Shelling and fighting had passed over our heads and uprooted us like the fir trees. Our masks of needles and leaves had been stripped off us by the war. Spiritually, we were just as torn and disfigured as the foliage after the battle. We were incapable of thinking anything beyond. Shells, detonations, explosions, black snow, blood, death. Later on, that black snow would symbolise for us the ravages the war had wrought in our young souls. Only a sheer hoarfrost veneer of toughness and danger and the fresh snow of silence concealed these wounds, till the last of us fell in the frost, piece by piece of our being broke off, and we became shadows of our former selves. We wanted to forget the past and bury it, yet we couldn't. We started rootling about in it once more, and freighted the urns of our dreams with what we had seen. An iron frost set in, as though a polar wind were blowing down from the stars. The white moon glowed more harshly down from the whirl of the clouds. 
Our hands and feet couldn't get warm. We suffered from persecution mania. Surrounded by death, we passed through these days, taking our leave. In the midst of death, we lived. We turned the commonplace on its head. We learned to hate our time and to curse the war. But within, we still resisted the idea that all sacrifice was futile, so as not to fall into the despair of the soldier in an exposed, hopeless position. The fighting was over, but it was only now that everything became real. Only now did we see how inhuman all our experience had been and try to give it some meaning and value. But reality compelled us to put away our cherished illusions. A spiritual struggle against reality began. But we found no magic word, no new illusion. Pitilessly, the war fitted into the microcosm of our world picture. The snow lasted, the nights remained full of silence, as though everything were just a dream. If we discovered any human feeling in our hearts, God's smile seemed to blow about our brows. We started believing again in better worlds that were being born out of defeat and no man's land, and when we closed our eyes, images of home came toward us like a column of pilgrims dipped in syrupy light. One day, even the dreams of soldiers would have to become lived life. We came with empty hands, but one day everything would be accomplished. We asked questions and pondered. We weren't living in a great time, even though many things happened in giant dimensions. Like the atoms of a storm, we passed through shocks and catastrophes and dreamed of the decline of the West as it tore itself to shreds. We participated in the tragedy. It was the triumph of the machine over man and God. The magnitude of the battles of steel and high explosives, the vast scale of undertakings, the exertions of material and strength in planetary space. This violence was undeniable, but it wasn't technology, but spirit and intellect that made a period great. Our own greatness was nothing but a dementia. Less than a scrap of steel, a man stood between unfettered forces, a cipher, a weapon, and an obedient body, servant to a machine. We didn't want to be like that, but we preferred to give ourselves to the chance of a battle, the mockery of a soldier's hazard, than to the certain death of law. Whether we were courageous or trembling, bold or cowardly, grimly prepared or frantic, as we went into battle, nothing weighed as anything compared with the fact that none of us went voluntarily. Only occasionally, on the brink of madness, was there the heroic sacrifice of an individual who had lost belief in his own life. We were soldiers, dulled beings, vegetating in trenches and bunkers, wasting our time without hope, bragging, swearing, worrying, enduring, obeying, dehumanised caricatures. It was very rare for any humanity to show itself in war, and if an isolated individual wanted to write and read and study, then there was a fight for a candle. Light was needed only for eating and for keeping watch, but not for the mind. Time was, war struck us as a necessity, as a divine commandment, a cosmic happening, purposing the completion and annihilation of the individual. But now we saw that war wasn't made for gods and men, that only ignorance could start an avalanche that would engulf everything. No victory, no conquest justified a single death, a man starved, frozen, lacerated, a single orphaned child. All war wanted was itself. And so we came to understand where our willingness had gotten us, and we remembered the heroic nihilism with which we had once set out from Jaroslaw. Now we humans could survive in inhumanity and love the intoxication and beauty of destruction, praise the shards of our own destinies, adore carrion, and give it our yes. But we didn't. We had been mistaken. We were the playthings of history and probabilities. Who were we? Just as our winter gear ended up leaving only our eyes uncovered, so soldierliness left minimal room for the expression of human traits. We were in uniform. Not just unwashed, unshaved, lousy and sick, but also spiritually ravaged. Nothing but a sum of blood, guts and bones. Our comradeship was made from mutual dependence, from living together in next to no space. Our humour was born out of sadism, gallows humour, satire, obscenity, spite, 
rage and pranks with corpses, squirted brains, lice, pus and shit, the spiritual zero. Our stir-craziness in our bunker set little blooms of wit sprouting from the manure of need. Philosophy, ethics and thought were replaced by self-preservation. We had no faith to sustain us, and philosophy served only to make our lot appear a little more bearable. The fact that we were soldiers was sufficient basis for criminality and degradation for an existence in hell. Our totems were self, tobacco, food, sleep and the whores of France. We didn't matter. Hunger, cold, spotted fever, diphtheria and frostbite, cripples and cadavers, bombed villages, looted cities, freedom and peace certainly didn't matter. Least of all did the individual human being matter. We could die unconcerned. Willie Peter Rees, aged two, in 1923, Willie with a cousin, 1925. Burning the Midnight Oil, circa 1935. A student in the Mercator Secondary School, Duisburg. Willie is second from the right in the second row. Testimonials from Willie's classmates in their commemorative magazine. Willie, as the proud high school graduate, with his mother, with his father. Vacationing in Prepau on the Das, circa 1937. To please his father, Willie joined a bank. His traineeship came to a premature end when he was drafted in 1941, on the exercise ground in the Eiffel, June 1941. Willie is standing, fourth from the right. Postcard to his mother, January 15, 1943. On a scrap of paper, Willie keeps a note of the address of a Jewish friend in Auschwitz. It reads, Rolf N., Prisoner in protective custody, born 12 Fars 11, 1920, number 11 513, block 2A, Auschwitz concentration camp, Upper Silesia, post office 2. In the jungle of Bryansk, Russia, in summer 1943. Willie is on the far left, going east and west, respectively, in a drawing accompanying the letter of July 12, 1943. Attempt at a self-portrait, July 20, 1943. Willie, with his unit, standing extreme left. The military hospital in Oberhof, Thuringia, March 1943. Letter to his parents, New Year's Day 1944. The freezing winter of 1944 in Russia, marching toward the Smolensk, Minsk log road, trying to get warm on the forest's edge at Selez. A typescript page of Willie's war book. The Beautiful She-Devil, a poem by Willie Peter Rees, April 18th. 1944. Red Cross Missing Persons Form from 1970. The balance of probability is that Willie Peter Rees met his end in the course of the fighting in the Vitebsk area sometime between June 22nd and 30th, 1944. Snowstorms came. We left the ghostwood and moved into the trenches and bunkers of the fishing pond, a wide gully that a creek flowed through, swamp sluggish and deep in snow. Tight caverns took us in. There was no more firewood, no more candles. It was a punishment transfer. The snowstorm foamed over hills and plains as we made our move through waist-deep snow with a sleigh, hour upon hour, panting, wheezing, cursing, and finally wearied to death. Powerless and with tears of rage, we lay in the snow, struggling to breathe. Ice crystals lashed our faces. At midnight, snow blind and on all fours, we reached our objective. We threw our blankets on the pallets of the unheated bunker and fell into a death-like sleep. For one hour. Then an order sent us back out into the pitchy night. We were to clear a sap. We dug till daybreak and watched as snow kept blowing over what we had cleared. Our felt boots got wet and ripped. Snow melted on our bare feet. We staggered back to our bunker as the Russians began to shoot at us, had to saw and chop wood, make fires, and then we wanted to sleep. But we got no rest. After not many hours we had to fetch munitions and equipment, and the day declined after long miles weighed down by boxes, spades and mortar shells. We missed the path and plunged into the creek, crawled back on firm ground and stumbled into the bunker. We changed into boots and were sent out into the unfamiliar terrain, ran around in circles, ended up in a minefield and fell over a tripwire. An explosion knocked us to the ground, 
but we remained unhurt. Late and unsuccessful, we found our way back to our bunker and were sent from there, without food, to the main resistance line. We reached it by the light of flares, our hands gauntleted in frozen gloves, our boots frozen. Seven hours we stood sentry, seven more hours in readiness in a bunker where there was no fire, where the snow lay a foot deep, and we shuddered with cold till we had to go out again, with frozen boots on our rigid feet, standing around on walls of snow without any cover, while a storm of ice needles, damp, flakes and hailstones battered our faces and clothes. That was the first night. In the morning we were given food and were allowed four hours sleep. A week went by. The cold came back and the fresh snow froze over. Now we alternated at night. Some nights we stood sentry for three hours and dug for five to keep the trenches, bunkers and firing positions free from snow. On others we stood guard in the sap straight through, reeling, freezing, exhausted and feverish with helpless rage. The snowstorm came again with unexampled force. When we left the bunker that night, we could see neither ground nor sky in the blackish-grey turbulence. A grey void. We couldn't find any path and groped our way along the gully, creeping, losing our footing and tumbling into the creek. The ice broke. The water went up past our knees, our arms were wet, and we kept on sinking. No one could hear our cries for help. Then we found firm ground, worked our way forward a step at a time, and pulled ourselves ashore. We spent another hour looking, and then we found our trench. We borrowed dry socks and gloves and went on watch. Four lots of two hours. We stood on a high ridge of snow. The storm howled, raged and battered at us from all directions at once, drove snow in our faces and pushed the flakes through every chink in our battered snowsuits. We were sodden. We could barely make out the flares in the dark. After our relief, we groped our way to the bunker, pulled off our frozen tunics and set them down, wrapped blankets over our shoulders and smoked with rigid fingers. No stove, knee-high snow, the wind chasing through the broken door. Our hands and feet refused to get warm. We fell asleep sitting. Three more lots of two hours on watch, and then we went back through the still raging storm to our own bunker. We had to spend two more hours sawing wood, light the stove with wet kindling, make coffee, and then we were given permission to sleep. Five hours, and then the next digging detail. But when we were awakened, we were blind. The blizzard had inflamed our eyes, as though they were scratched slides, our lids red and swollen, everything distorted, our eyes sore and teary. We had to stay awake. So we wrote letters without seeing what we were writing. Only the thought of peace and our mothers kept us from killing ourselves. We cursed God. This exceeded what a man could take. We were desperate. There was no end in sight. The following morning I had made up my mind. In the harsh sunlight I crawled out of the bunker and stood up. One bullet whistled by, the second hit. That was salvation. I crawled back into the bunker and got myself bandaged up. The wound in my right thigh didn't bleed much and wasn't very painful. The thought that I might be saved from the hell of the fishing pond meant that I gladly took the shock and the slight stinging. The sun was still gleaming over hoarfrost and snow. I had to wait till dusk before I could go to a doctor. Happily, and as it were, with one long sigh of relief, I sat on my pallet. My eyes grew clear again, and I wrote the glad news home and to my friends. Then I packed up my writing things, soap, towel and books. That was all I took with me. Propped on the shoulder of a comrade, I dragged myself to the doctor in the blue light of evening, was given a tetanus injection, and waited for a sleigh to take me to the main aid station in Charitonovo, to the golden sounds of a Mozart symphony on the wireless. A medical orderly took me on his arm like a child and carried me to the sleigh. The horses trotted through the clear night. Flares glimmered up at ever-increasing distances over the forests. The snow crunched under the sleigh runners and a meteor plunged to earth. Home. My immobile feet froze, my wound burned, 
but I didn't attend to pain or cold. Going home. In Charitonovo, the doctor cleaned out the rim of the wound and made an incision between entry and exit wound. He took off my boots and had my frozen feet massaged. The pain abated. Blood flowed through my limbs again, and blissfully I sank into a long, wonderful and dreamless sleep. In the morning, a heated sleigh brought me to Atinovo. I was deloused and sent to a barracks, was carried into treatment on a stretcher, was supplied with brandy and cigarettes, and drank and slept through this night also. I was awakened early, driven to Papino, and loaded onto a hospital train to Viasma. Sitting up in a passenger train, I rode west, via Smolensk and Vitebsk, to Dunaburg, where, more on account of my exhausted appearance than the gravity of my wound, a kindly doctor furnished me with a pass home. Going home. The next evening the train pulled into Virbalen. We were taken off in pouring rain, but the rain seemed to me a consoling miracle after months in the ice and snow. I checked my small luggage and my uniform to be deloused. Nurses took off my bandages. We were bathed and sent to a waiting room to wait for our clothes and get bandaged up. I sat in a room with two hundred naked soldiers. Soldiers with frostbite on their hands and feet, bullet wounds all over their bodies, shrapnel everywhere, swellings, and a few, not many, with mental illnesses. Two doctors and two nurses applied bandages in this depot of human misery produced by the war. The doctors did duty for a week at a stretch. The nurses changed daily, since even the hardest hearts and the strongest nerves couldn't stand more of that pussy, rotting, bleeding chaos of pain, devastation and screams. I saw flesh fall from dead toes and pale bones glimmer through the putrescence, Icor dribble out of festering wounds, faces disfigured by tumours, dead skin hanging in ribbons from burn wounds, and the stumps of amputated arms and legs sticking out grotesquely and spectrally from bloodless trunks. One soldier held out the stump of his right arm to the elder of the two doctors. The surgical swabs were still in it, grown over in the course of days without medical attention. The doctor tugged at them with his pincers, and the soldier looked aside. There was dread in his eyes. He groaned and then screamed aloud like a helpless animal, a long, drawn-out, tormented, agonising wail. The doctor's hands shook, sweat beaded on his brow. In vain he tried to come up with soothing words. Helplessly the young nurse stroked the soldier's hair and mopped the sweat on his deathly pale face. Slowly he slipped to the ground. His unconsciousness touched us all in the manner of a gift. I took refuge in a cigarette. The doctor hurriedly bandaged him up and left. Whoever had seen this and dared to speak just one single word in favour of this war was no human. He was worse than a criminal. It was a relief to me to breathe the cool, silent air of night as, propped on a stick, I walked to a barracks to wait for the onward transport. I travelled via Dresden 33 to Oberhof Hospital in Thuringia. I was at home. Hills clad with evergreen forests and the last of the winter's snow, valleys with rivers swollen by meltwater, simple houses and smooth roads outside the window of my room, which I shared with good comrades. My wound began to hurt. The stresses of the journey had inflamed it. My leg swelled up. One evening I was lying in bed with a high temperature. I was reading a fantastic book, and its barely understood events mingled in my half-sleep with memories of the white hell of the fishing pond, the ghost wood, long-forgotten adventures in the endless Russian expanses, the dead and dying, childhood dreams and celebrations, women, and the vision of Verbalen. By the time the fever broke, I was utterly exhausted. I read, wrote, and slept. Before long I had no peace and no way back into myself. Memories tracked me like furies. I kept reliving the terrors of the winter campaign, hearing the howling of shells and the screams of the wounded, saw soldiers charge and fall and myself like a stranger in my destiny on the edge of no man's land. I sensed the ravages the war had wrought in me saw the overgrown gardens of my boyhood, 
and knew I was condemned to a shadow life in the witch's cauldron of memory. I felt abandoned by God and his angels, left out in a vast cosmos, swinging in the void between distant stars. My pondering and self-scrutiny revolved unceasingly around the war. Carrion and horror had become my element. I was a soldier, a wicked warrior, a living corpse, a stranger among happy men, indifferent among the grieving, as incapable of happiness and grief as of pity and love. My intellectual world was sinking, and there was only death dancing on its ruins. An illusory existence among lies and masks was all that remained to me. And this was what the war had made of my life. I remained silent. When I was allowed to get up, I found neither peace nor oblivion, even on long walks in the wooded hills of early spring, and when I lost the ability to sleep at night, I sought refuge in wine and finally found help in morphine. It brought me only a leaden sort of sleep, and when I woke, despair, memories and emptiness took possession of me again. It was only from new experiences and contacts that I hoped for a cure and a turn in my fortunes. I was released and came home. I read, but no book offered me any signs or portents. I wrote, but words and thoughts were a colourless, formless tangle. I listened to Brahms's requiem. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass is withered, and the flower fallen away. Music did nothing but multiply my grief for a lost world. Gradually I did learn to forget and found some hope again. I travelled to Lake Constance, and there, finally, all the past sank in the fleeting happiness of a love affair. A new life, a new adventure began, and if all these beginnings remained just an embassy from a better, kinder world, even that was something. And when it was over, I was able to say a quiet goodbye. It had to be. Life went on. The Russian Wandering Travelling into summer life went on. My return home had become a sort of flight into experience. It was only in parties, amours, travels and events that, like an adventurer, I could find some meaning for my life, overcome the war within me, or at least hide it under a thin layer of varnish. And so I volunteered for the front. I wanted to fight fire with fire and war with war. I cried out for wanderings, sufferings, hardships and the wide world, so as to slough off my introspection to compel life by living it. I challenged my destiny to single combat. I brought with me no affirmation, no readiness and no hope. I threw myself away because I had lost my belief in mind and spirit and because not even love could change me or fulfil me. In Russia, I had to gather together the stray pieces of myself. There, my trajectory must reach an end, either the making or the destroying of me. And so I saved for myself the last freedom that remains to the soldier, the embers in the ashes, to choose early and of my own free will the lot that I couldn't escape in any case. No heroic nihilism, no belief in the ineluctable, and no faith in God went with me. It was purely as a wanderer and an adventure seeker that I set out this time. I was a little crazy as I awaited the moment of departure. I drew a line under my life wrote to thank my beloved, drank once more in the circle of my friends, spent one further night at home, and travelled along the Rhine, as if I had already caught a whiff of the great adventure. Electrical storms were suspended over the landscape. The journey began. I left behind the bombed cities of home, the wreckage of my youth, and I stood to for the command of the hour. We celebrated the departure with wine and champagne, and at midnight I was travelling drunkenly through the unlit shapes of my hometown, buildings enjoying no more than a shadowy existence, sacrificed to the war, ruins of past felicity. I wanted to embrace my destiny and my ruin. Secretly I was hoping for a further return home, because I did want to live out my youth and my yearning, but I agreed to die if that was what the stars had in mind for me. Slowly the train rumbled eastward. Lod, Warsaw, Orsha, Smolensk. I drank day and night, brandy, vodka, gin. 
I was barely ever sober for more than an hour at a time because then misery gripped me. Dread of what lay ahead took hold of me, and the war reclaimed me. My thoughts strayed over vast areas, and contradictions multiplied. I no longer had any perspective on things. The war had become a divinely ordained purgatory. The only thing that still had any meaning was the quest for God. Everywhere I caught already the putrid smell of irony, and it was only where the edges of things became unclear that the mysteries began. But myself I could not understand. The war had become an insane variant of introspection. I was partly responsible for it, even if I hadn't asked for terror and fear of death. But I was on my way with my fellow penitents, and my life became a sort of legend to myself. In my heart, though, the world no longer made sense, and it was only in drink that the conflicting spirits got along. So I viewed my departure as a comedy, a chaos of contradictions and errors, masquerades of words and pictures, and suddenly the whiff of adventure overcame me again, a divine frivolity that rejected any and all responsibility. I calculated there would be enough time afterward for tears. Once more the vast expanse of Russia lay outside the windows, grey skies, meadows, scattered trees, rarely a building. It was raining. Hay and grain were rotting away. I slept and drank. In the sunset at Smolensk, I heard women singing. They sang between trains that crossed here, east and west, melancholy, lost in their eerie, cruel, fertile country, and a soil that would not honour any amount of sacrifice. In the moonlit night, horns sounded. There were calls from obscure distances, coming nearer and losing themselves in other distances, a sound full of yearning, fatigue, and homesickness, and yet a romantic greeting, an embassy from life in the enemy land. In the evening we were taken off the train at Yarzevo. We overnighted in a barn and the next day rested at Filipovo. There, after a long time on the road, I saw girls dancing in the evening again. To the monotonous sound of balalaika music, they stepped and twirled in a ring of young men, sometimes sang in soft plaint and spun again in a mute dance, took hands with slow movements, parted them again, and exited the ring with a light bow. Their white headscarfs glowed in the sunset and went on gleaming in the rising moon. Distance was reflected on their impassive faces. Crickets chirped in the mournful balalaika noise, and we soldiers sang and laughed with strangers, as if the distant sound of the front were not echoing in the ancient dance. I was happy. In the middle of Russia, I at last felt at home. This was where I belonged. Nowhere other than in this world, with its horrors and sparse joys, was it good to be. Only here did my soul find its strange element. A thunderstorm was hissing, and pale yellow light crashed through the clouds. A rainbow built its laborious arch over alders, pasture land and forest clearings. I went into position in Vorotinovo, a village where only ruins were left protruding through the tall grass and profusion of flowers. That was the critical point in our position at Vopez. The Russians were just in front of our trenches, and day and night we traded mortar shells and bombs with them. A wild blooming and sprouting covered our trenches, and the bunker itself disappeared under a pelt of corn and weeds. In spite of that, it felt almost like a skyscraper, the way it loomed out of its slope, and not a few shells whistled hard over our heads and stuck in its upper walls. I had no need to get acclimatised here. This was my house. I wasn't just a guest. Nights we spent digging in the misty landscape, under the moon and stars, till blue-grey dusk. Flares whizzed past, explosive shells hit, sudden assaults of mortars forced us under cover, but the danger didn't frighten us. It soothed me to be remote from everything intellectual and from all the movements of my spirit. Letters helped against the isolation. The muted beauty of the scenery around Vopez was now my life, not the war. Sunrise, the movements of the clouds, dusk and starry nights built a world where I felt cheerfully at home. Nothing but a wanderer, an adventurer, an itinerant student of life, I stared into the nameless face of war. 
All the powers might be striving for one another's extermination. What manned the trenches barely deserved the name of man. They were more like soulless tools of destruction, fanatics of doom. There was hardly a pause between engagements for the individual man to think of his being made in God's image and the foes to feel their shared fate. Being made a prisoner was a terror, and being wounded in no man's land meant almost certain death. The operation of these elemental forces provided the setting for me to live and be in magic horror, a wanderer between dust and stars in that unhinged time. Death and killing were the only aim of this tussle. There was no conflict of politics or philosophy. Each man was fighting for his life and no longer for ideals and a delusory meaning. Everything finally devolved to a futile waste of men and material. We stayed there a few more days, bronzed by the July sun. Then orders came that we were to be relieved, and we departed at night. And so began my Russian wanderings. The uncertain tracks of that year began. It